Um, so this is um, our project for the Chad Gordon um, Autism Campus in Haringey, which has recently been completed. Uh, we're looking at um, a day centre for people with autism and learning disabilities, so very high support needs. And behind where the photographer is standing and linked by the coloured path is um, a drop-in hub for people with Asperger's. So it's people who are living kind of pretty unsupported and independent lives, but they do come together for self-help advice on housing and that kind of thing. They sort of, they tend to um, develop their own activities according to the needs of the group, sometimes cookery classes and things like that. Um, we're a small female owned architectural practice. And for the last 15 years, we've specialized in designing buildings for a wide range of disabilities. We started with buildings for homeless people and have moved on from there. Um, all of our projects have involved extensive consultation with users and carers and service providers. So each time we gain more knowledge, which then um, you know, feeds back into the next project. Um, and that um, covers that knowledge covers both the general approach and the detailing of individual elements when we're designing for the neurodivergent. Um, it's very important that actually the, um, the principles are carried right through to construction. It's not just about the design and it's not just about the detailing. Um, in addition to typical architect services, we've acted as advisors on a number of um, larger scale regeneration projects. And we also give presentations to local authorities and housing associations to spread the knowledge. Uh, and we have regular meetings with their local Islington Asperger support group and um, close contact with quite a lot of the support providers and they comment on our schemes. Um, this was one of our um, earlier disability schemes. This is a, a horticultural training center for Thrive in Battersea Park. So this uh, aims at all sorts of different kinds of um, disabilities, but including autism um, and uh, dementia and ASD, DSD and all of those sorts of things. Um, but so our experience covers um, autism and we've done horticultural therapy buildings, day centers, supported housing and high needs one-off housing. And then we've also done projects for people with mental health uh, issues such as dementia and mixed mental health um, disabilities such as autism and learning disabilities. So it's a range of our projects. So on to disabilities and neurodiversity. Um, part M of the building regulations refers in the main to wheelchair accessibility issues with brief mention of age related issues. Whereas there are a huge number of disabilities and neurological issues that have would also have got requirements when you're designing buildings, and these requirements are not necessarily the same as uh, for wheelchair accessibility. So we've divided them roughly here into physical disabilities, and we've put uh, little wheelchair symbols against the uh, conditions that might need wheelchairs, um, or do, or might. Um, and then there's the, the whole area of neurodivergence, um, which quite no, doesn't necessarily mean you need a wheelchair at all. Um, so uh, a few definitions. Uh, obviously, the field of physical disabilities is very wide, and we've, we can only list a few here. And quite often, you would get a combination of these with people uh, with autism. They may have a, a physical disability in addition. Um, but often, neurodivergent people, it should be said, are not very mobile. And um, it's not, uh, but not a severe dis physical disability. Um, there, for severe, that is no, no more common than in the general population. Neurodiversity refers to the different ways the brain works and interprets in information. It is the concept that all humans vary in terms of neurocognition. It highlights that people naturally think, learn, communicate, and experience the world differently with unique strengths and challenges. So Naoki Hikashida, who is a teenage um, Japanese boy with autism, said, when a neurotypical person sees an object, it seems that you see it as an entire thing first and only afterwards do its details follow on. But for people with autism, the details jump straight out at us first of all, and then only gradually, detail by detail, does the whole image sort of float up into focus. So when an individual diverges from the dominant so societal standards of typical neurocognitive functioning, I can get these words out, they are neurodivergent. Um, types of neurodivergent con conditions are listed here. 
Um, and But it isn't just, um, and they often don't see themselves as having a disability. Uh, it often brings exceptional skills and talents, um, such as innovation, creativity, and problem solving. Um, but, and the terms neurodivergent and neurominority can be uh, used interchangeably. Being neurodivergent in a world set up for neurotypical people can lead to the experience of barriers that result in exclusion, isolation, and a loss of independence. And it's estimated that about one in seven people, more than 15% of the UK in the UK are neurodivergent, meaning that the brain functions, learns and processes information differently. Okay, so uh, sensory, um, the senses are primary um, and underpinning the differences really between neurodivergent and neurotypical people. Um, obviously we all perceive the world through our senses um, and neurodivergency affects somebody's interaction with the world around them and the way they live because their sensory responses are different to those of neurotypical people. Um, the, the sense responses of a neurodivergent person can be physical or they can be perceptual and they can be very heightened which can lead to sensory avoidance or they can be very depressed which might lead to people seeking um, sensory stimulation so for example leaving taps on and oak flooding bathrooms and that kind of thing um, and when the sensory um, overload is too high it can be to the point of physical pain so certain kinds of situations can be physically painful for people who are neurodivergent um, obviously we all know about um, hearing smell taste sight and touch um, but some other senses that need to be considered are vestibular which is about balance and spatial orientation interoception which is about the perception of your own body sensations and proprioception which is the awareness of your own body position so that's something that we've all become very aware of in covid So um, we're now going to run very briefly through a number of the common key issues that uh, come with some of the, for, for the neurodivergent. There is, but it should be said, there is no one trait or issue for each condition. So differing personal reactions are common and sometimes people have multiple conditions and associated multiple and differing issues. Um, responses to uh, situations can be to situations, places, people and objects. Particular senses can be heightened or depressed, as Jill has said, leading to overstimulation, apathy, distress, pain, or other sensory responses. And certain elements or situations can be triggers that bring on stress reactions and re anxiety. So we're going to talk through a few of the um, key uh, elements that affect um, sensory perception. So this is about light. Um, the image on the left hand side is an example of kind of really poor lighting for someone who is neurodivergent. Um, the light source is uh, very glary and bright. It's probably um, a fluorescent lamp which might flicker or hum. And the general poor impression is kind of increased by the fact that you get then get the reflection of the light in the shiny floor. Um, so artificial light is obviously um, essential, um, it makes things visible. Um, ideally for a neurodivergent person it would be a, um, a hidden light source and it would definitely, controls would be really important so no um, humming or buzzing um, or dimming, but dimming is great especially in a, in a, a shared, a, shared um, a care setting or a home because many people are actually really sensitive to, to high levels of lighting so things like shopping centres can be very difficult um, but it's useful to mark key locations and objects make make wayfinding um, easier um, and uh, gives a sense of security and the other thing to remember is that people with dementia um, and elderly people need about 10 times the amount of lighting a, as a younger person and poor eyesight can be quite common so so good levels of lighting but sensitively judged um, daylight most autistic people love daylight, it's great, but sunlight and shadows um, can be quite difficult. They can misinterpret the shadows as holes or bars of shadows. Reflections are a problem. Um, 
And this is on the right is the Neil McLaughlin uh, building in Oxford, which obviously was shortlisted for the Sterling Prize. Um, but this is what our focus group had to say about it. I'm just looking at that picture and there's lines everywhere. It's lines yeah. on the floor, lines on the ceiling, lines, poles in the, you know, yeah. in the middle. Yeah. Yeah. I would be really uncomfortable. Yeah. yeah. So, um, so uh, 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 an autistic has written, daylight is pure sensory and cognitive peace. Cover electric lights, no downlighting, no glare, no hard shadows. Which pretty well sums it up. So um, here, this is, uh, the subject here is visual cluster and roots. Uh, some people may find themselves overwhelmed in the busy visual stimulus in some environments. Um, this is the Alpha Beta building. Um, and uh, we have a very confusing uh, corridor with multiple lights and you know, um, level changes and uh, markings on the floor. Entrances and changes of level can be of um, particular importance as the way surface or zone is delimited. Um, Things need to be clear and simple, distinguish walls and ground and take care with pattern, hue and contrast. Sometimes colours can be an issue, but um, they are also acceptable for use as um, signage and uh, direction. Uh, but this, for the picture on the right, is what they had to say about this corridor. Oh my God, um, I find it scary. I, I would never ever want to, I just wouldn't go in there. If my favourite gallery and pictures was upstairs, I don't know. It, You'd never get it, there. It, 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 it's, off, it's scary, yeah. it's horrible. It's, it's horrible. Um, I can't see the door very clearly. I can't see where the walls end and the ceilings begin. I think they like to have things, as, as they're saying, very clear. They like clear signage, clear direction, and uh, if possible, a route that doesn't involve what we might find visually very exciting like this. What they said about these images was, where does the autistic person hide? So what you need is liminal spaces so they can they can get out of the main route if it's full of people or it's just too overwhelming. There's somewhere they can reset. That's a really important thing. Another common issue is sound. Um, sound can be perceived as physical pain and um, background sounds uh, come to the fore if you've got that, uh, that heightened sensibility. Um, it's probably one of the most common issues affecting people with all disabilities, in fact. Um, and, uh, but equally, it can also be something that gives people a great deal of pleasure. Uh, so some people, autistics, may like uh, very loud music. They like to play their own music at high volume but can't stand other people's. Sounds a bit like anybody else, but anyway, um, that they, they would find that very disturbing. But other noises, so sort of sudden noises, sudden bangs, big group um, activities, um, multiple noises in something like a shopping centre or an airport, uh, background fans, extract fans, hand dryers, and reflective surfaces that bounce sound around, or, or all things that could trigger the uh, trigger this issue. So um, another autistic person said. I have no means to filter sensory input. They all come across at the same volume and brightness. I'm hypersensitive on all my senses. Everything is very loud to me at all times and in all places. This is what I hear when lots of people are around me. Imagine the echo in the room and the noises of feet shuffling, clothes rustling, crockery clinking and more. There's no quiet. I can hear every sound someone makes. One of the loudest sounds to me is the noise their clothes make as they move. The voice is way back underneath an overlay of sounds. Blah, blah, blah is the fumbling soft sounds of speech. So autistic people may find it very difficult to um, understand what you're saying to them because they're so overwhelmed by the sound of you breathing and you moving and other people in the room. It's not you know, that they can't understand speech, it's just that their senses are kind of being bombarded with everything all at once. And they commented that um, you know they may appear to react slowly, or but they're trying to process the information and pull the right bit of information. You know they look at your questioning face and think I should be saying something, but I don't know what it is. 
or I should be doing something. And this could um, um, affect sort of emergency situations halfway. Um, but equally, we were carrying out work on the improvements of a house for an autistic boy with very severe impairments. And he loved the noise the workman made. We'd gone to a huge trouble to try and get everything in the quiet times, but actually he wanted to stand and watch and listen. So temperature, smell, ventilation, air quality was through very quickly. Um, smell is another assault on the senses for an autistic person. Um, it affects what spaces they might want to go into or go out of. Um, and uh, and it um, ca can be really distressing if it's a really uh, strong smell. Uh, air quality is important. People with uh, neuro neurodivergent people tend to be quite sensitive to things like VOCs and good air quality and even temperature is important. Um, and then obviously linked with that is uh, ventilation, good ventilation and temperature needs to be fairly even, not too hot, not too cold. So ways of heating up quickly and cooling down quickly are quite important and good controls so that the internal environment can be kept steady and um, clean and fresh. Movement and touch. Physical movement, um, some people with autism and, and um, other disabilities um, benefit from the movement to soothe or calm um, uh, or release and release them from panic as well as just giving them exercise, obviously. This might be uh, slow or it might be fast. It could be cycling and running. Some, some autistics uh, are known as runners. They will, if, a, if they panic, they will just run away. Um, or it might be a ref repetitive moment of movement, uh, such as swinging or bouncing. So it can help with uh, balance and physical health, uh, flexibility and motor control, and uh, as well as mood. So it's good to try and create opportunities for bouncing and swinging and wander loops or circuits, uh, opportunities for gardening activities. Um, and because nature has strong beneficial effects, whether as a view or having access to it. Natural materials are always very welcome and don't seem to have the adverse effects that man-made materials do. Um, and it, nature can provide an excellent retreat space when, you're, when they're overstimulated. We did a garden with the Thrive Building where there was a little enclosure where they, they all, everyone knew that it, you, know, you could run in there and you weren't, didn't have to run away. You could run in there and you'd just be left and you could calm yourself down and nobody would join you. Um, but above that, obviously, there's the benefits of giving uh, uh, an awareness of the weather and seasons and the time of day. That's sort of logging into your environment. OK, so social interaction and communication. Um, it's probably not true to say that autistic people don't like to communicate with other people and they don't like to be with other people, but actually what they don't necessarily want to be do is talking. So people uh, will quite like to be in the same space and doing the same thing and they'll kind of communicate non-verbally. So um, they'll, they, they, you know, they, they, they will be very happy um, probably in a room with a lot of other people doing something that they like to do, but nobody talking to each other. So they, there's a sort of different way of communicating. Um, I think autistic people also find it quite hard to find the right level of assistance. So we've, we've had some of our user groups saying when they're out and about uh, going on a visit to something, then people will come up and try to help them, whereas actually they don't need help and they don't want help. And it's a bit stressful to sort of, um, to put it off. So, you know, they, 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 they quite like to be just left to get on and do their own thing. Um, and they also like to um, pause and observe and consider before joining in activities. So for example, if you have a, a day centre with a range of activities going on, if you can have a window by the door so people can look in and see what's going on, then they can make a decision and, and you know, before they actually decide to go and join that activity. Um, in other ways, they're very direct and very straight. So um, the kind of signage in the middle, it would be really popular with autistic people because it tells you what direction to go what you're heading towards and how far away. They much prefer that to any other kind of more arty or more beautiful kind of sign. And they'll take things literally. So if they see, uh, some people, if they see a, a sign saying break glass for key, 
they'll break glass for the key. It doesn't say break glass for key if there's a fire. So they'll break, they'll, they'll, they'll follow it, follow it through. Um, and the, the sort of, sort of following on from that, I suppose, um, not always a kind of awareness of cause and effect. So you might throw something out of a window, but not think that it would, you know, there would be the pleasure of the movement and the object falling out of the window without <laughs> a consideration of the fact that that might actually um, land on somebody or hurt them. They wouldn't want to hurt somebody, but they just wouldn't think that far ahead. Um, and actually that sort of literalness means it's quite hard to communicate with drawings and sketches because they don't really kind of connect a drawing to something that could could be happening in the future so not that that good at, at um, kind of processing what a, a, how a drawing might might become a place um, and finally I think um, bottom left uh, very orderly you know they like uh, things to happen when they know they're going to happen and in order to a pattern so that's the kind of um, board that each um, autistic person at a day centre would have so they would know uh, what activities they were going to do, who was going to help them do them and who else was going to be there with them and um, if, if those patterns change that can be something quite difficult so for example um, a journey to work for an autistic person they would be very punctual because they would fall into a routine and always go at the same time but then if the train was late or the bus was late that would probably cause them an awful lot more stress than it would would somebody neuro neurotypical a comment they made was we do not do generalizations we do many details instead and that's bad in his view because that's not the way we work obviously Memory, reasoning, fixations, and repetitive behaviour. Um, they may have, it, if they're coupled with a, um, a mental disability of any other kind, they may have uh, gaps in their in their memory and and uh, therefore and also may misinterpret or misread the signs that um, <coughs> would be obvious to any of us. Um, so, for instance, the black and white paving might well be read as um, a hole in the ground or you know, something that's undulating or not level, it might be completely misread. And so that, that's obviously had effects on the way we design. Uh, the orderliness, uh, the, the picture of the shed, that's the Thrive tool shed. Um, they like, it was part of the day's routine that they sort of get it, got everything out and put everything away and it, everything had its place. Um, so distinct, if you're designing a, um, an environment, the, you know, distinctive, elements or colours can act as landmarks and uh, to, to clearly mark routes that would enable them to move through an environment more, more easily. Um, they can have fixations, um, which can be demonstrated as hyper-focus and concentration, um, and they, but they also can be extremely knowledgeable about and have special interests like trains or bikes or things like that. Um, but this is a, the picture on the bottom left is a, a little boy walking a line that's to help him calm down because it, it, that's when things get out of hand they may need this repetitive behavior uh, which uh, which will help calm their uh, distress um, so that but you equally you could put on headphones they, you'll see them wearing children that child in the previous picture was wearing a headphone so that he didn't get distressed by the noise around him and that's how he could go out in public uh, but they do rocking and what they call stimming, which is where they fiddle with an object repetitively. And they do things in certain orders all the time. So I think we've managed to communicate all of that. <laughs> okay, so what happens if these aren't addressed? Yeah, so if, you, if, if people have sensory overload, that can cause them physical pain and meltdowns. It can, can cause, cause confusion and anxiety. So... Uh, a meltdown might consist of um, somebody running away. It might consist of banging their head against the wall, kicking a hole in a wall, pulling a cupboard door off, those kinds of quite violent physical activities. So a kind of way to release the kind of pent up stress that has become from, come from this sensory overload. Um, so normally they need to get away. That might be to a natural place, as Helen has just said, that's quite a good calming down or possibly, you know, their bedroom or a place, you know, a little sort of den with a curtain around it or something so that, so that or a room with 
very low light level so that so that people can kind of reset and on a on a kind of slightly less um uh extreme version i think that quite often autistic people who say go to the airport or go to a shopping center they they plan for the fact that that's going to be an extremely stressful situation for them and when they come back they are going to have to find their kind of safe place and spend time resetting before they they go out anywhere else or meet anybody else um, so the things that could happen, sensory overload uh, is the inability to act for themselves, a reduction in their ability to participate in general life, meltdowns and shutdowns, confusion, extreme anxiety, isolation, fear, depression, um, a working of their conditions, um, an additional load on support teams and physical damage to themselves or their property. So if if their environment can be, the environment can be designed so that autistic people don't experience that sensory overload and don't experience those um, things, then everything gets easier. You know, they have less meltdowns, they're less likely to cause damage, they're less likely to run away. If they need high support needs, then um, the teams will probably uh, be a bit lighter, a bit less. We did some work to a house for a uh, autistic boy with very um, high needs and once we completed the work then they needed one less carer overnight which obviously is a is a is a benefit in terms of cost and it's a benefit in terms of the autistic person gaining more independence so it's really important that these things are, are attended to and obviously this can apply um to to the designing of the particular dwelling or place um, for somebody specifically, but it also can just do, could be applied to the design of all our residential areas and our accommodation um, or cities. Um, in that, it, ideally, these we could permit um, the neurodivergent to live among us and be able to operate for themselves and to um, encourage them to enhance their own lives, as as you know, which we all get the benefit because we can we know our way around. So, um, so in the, the quote, there's a Brissenden quote, which says independence is not linked to the physical or intellectual capacity to care for oneself without assistance. Independence is created by having assistance when and how one requires it. Um, so too often, as we said at the start, disability policies and design is geared all around wheelchair accessibility. And there's very little in this strategy for the wider range of disabilities. Um, and equally, it might be said of the new autism, national autism strategy that came out very recently, not much to give better provision. Um, so, as we said, the ambition is to give, to, to give somebody independent and supported semi-independent living and then enable their personal development and in independence. Um, and ideally create cohesive communities that can live side by side um, and it'd be better for everybody if because there'd be less care needs fewer care needs and if the, if the design could actually help of, uh, with this we get a reduction in care a lessening of building maintenance to you know people if if you know, for instance, you it's not you can't put your head through the wall and get the stimulation from doing that. Um, then you know you haven't got to constantly repair the walls. Support team costs can go down, um, and that can make add this unknown worth to any scheme. Um, so it needs an across-the-board approach, really. Okay, so um, our advice would be um, audit the scheme at regular intervals to see how you are addressing the needs of neurodivergent people and you could use the, um, you could sort of uh, consider each of the senses in turn as a way of um, deciding how your, how your, your project is affecting them. Um, at the briefing stage, you need to assess the support and consider the facilities that op offer opportunities for socialising or learning, such as community classes for certain groups or semi-private enclosed gardens and a local support team base. Um, you need to be mindful when you're designing of some of the key triggers and issues of which we would say sound is, is the greatest. But 
all autistic people are different and they all have their own individual triggers and they'll mostly talk about them quite openly if you ask. Um, give alternatives. You can't be all things to all people. So give alternative routes, give alternative locations of flats, give different layouts, give different controls. So uh, it doesn't mean that everybody has to have all the time, all the things that would suit a disabled person. But if you want to do a particular lighting or something that you think is going to be overstimulating, then give people a way to get around it. Um, reduce conflicting and multiple stimuli wherever possible. And if you can't build in retreats, keep it simple. Um, be clear, lay out signage routes, clear and straightforward. Um, enable as much sensory control as possible within people's homes, very robust construction and have the potential for adaptations because many different people will need different needs. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, I should say, um, for a wonderful presentation and so much I think that many of us didn't didn't know uh, when designing for neurodiverse communities. I have lots of questions, but um, it's more for the audience as well. If they have any questions, put them in the chat and I can read them out if you're scared of speaking. Um, or you can unmute yourself if you're feeling super confident and you can ask that way. Um, great, David Hart has put one in the question uh, in chat and I'll read it out for those who can't see it. Uh, David says, thank you for an informative and enlightening talk. Um, you mentioned the difficulty neurodivergent people can experience in interpreting drawings of projects. I wondered if there were any other mediums that worked better, physical models, any problems with AR or VR to be aware of? Uh, we, we've tried physical models. They work quite well. They will re be returned to you in pieces because they would have taken them apart. Um, uh, but they do, they, they like playing with them. And I don't think they can necessarily identify um, with you know, that that is the space they're going to get. That's, that's the main problem. And the same would, the same would be with any um, showing them a film or, or something like that. Um, we've found when we're doing our consultations that showing pictures of uh, environments are a very good way of sort of finding out what they like. And often their carers will have an awful lot more to say about it because they will know that, that they should know what they like and what are the issues. Um, but that, I think, yeah, I think so. But you have to bear in mind when you show them a picture, as, as some of the pictures we've shown you today, the thing they'll pick out is when, like the one with the coloured ramp, they picked out, there's a barcode painted on the wall as a, as a sort of joke. They picked that first and commented on that. It's not the most obvious thing in the picture. Because as we said, they look at the, the, at details. the details. I think you might want to be a bit careful with virtual reality. It might be a bit overwhelming. You'd have to, I don't, I don't know, I haven't got experience of it, but I think you'd want to be mm. pretty careful about um, the sound. I mean, maybe something with the sound turned off. So it's just, you know, visual. You don't, you're not trying to do too many things at once with it, it might, might be better. What about simply just describing the space you're going to be inhabiting just through words and you know talking talking to them about it? They can't visualise. Okay, fine. Can't visualize. <laughs> 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 you could describe it, which is uh, you know we, why we try to use models, um, okay. particularly ones they could hold up and you know look into. That worked quite well. Where we had ones yeah, yeah. Old, they could see the space. Yeah, yeah, and they. Um, I think once you get to a, you know, you can talk to people about how they want to furnish their flat when they can see the flat and they like red. So you guess that, you know, they want a red sofa and a red rug and a red curtain and a red, you know, kitchen mm -hmm. chair or whatever. So sort of once it gets to that level of specificity, it's not so bad, but they're not, not very good at conceptualizing really. And it depends no. a bit on the level of, of, of the disability. If, if it's somebody with Asperger's, they probably, they may not visualise it that well, but once you get them into the details, we had a client who, who was better at specification than, because he knew every last bit about it than we were. And he was an immense learning curve for us, you know, mm. a real resource. Um, but, but then again, he was, he was a high functioner, as they say, which is a horrible term. Yes. Um, you mentioned the need for, oh, there's another question. I'll, I'll read that out from Dieter. Um, lots of great knowledge. Thank you both, uh, Dieter says. Perhaps similar to last question, given your knowledge of autism and neurodiversity, and in particular how challenging it is for neurodiverse people to comprehend the future impact of design decisions, 
How is it best to engage? Does one focus on scenarios and immediate responses to inform the design, or is there another way to build empathy and understanding? Well, I think it's, um, yeah, it's, it's quite good to try and build up a bit of a relationship. And I think you can, you know, talk around, you can show sort of images of things that are similar to what you might want to do and say, and talk about, you know, what do you think of this kind of planting or what do you think of this kind of street lighting, you know, and they'll talk about what's in front of them. Be particular but you know so you need to be quite particular and i think that's a better way than trying to um talk about it in the abstract so, you know if you just say what kind of street lighting would we like here you probably won't get terribly far but if you showed three different kinds and said mm. which do you like best then you you would get a response mm -hmm. so i think it's a question of sort of you know building up a kind of field of references really and, yeah. and building empathy and i'm just understanding with the latest project we had quite a lot of meetings and some of them with but, but with the the, or the team that were going to run the building but with the parents and the support group and 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 some of the uh young people and older people who were going to use the building itself and it was sort of over time i think and they were allowed to come and visit the building as it was being built as soon as we could make it safe enough um, and that sort of we particularly that's very important building in some um, visits as you go along if you can so that they go start to get used to it it's a place mm -hmm. that gets put that's into their important. orderly minds as it were and they start to know their way around and we did we did work very hard on that um, with by having lots of visits I've done, done so many tours and I think uh, most of the um, you know the the Asperger uh, people who are living independent lives are really keen to talk about what they need and what they want mm. they're really you know they're very aware of what they need and they're really keen to pass that on to other people and they you know um they quite often give talks to businesses about how to be autism friendly in employment mm. and you know mm -hmm. they talk about you know when you go to the theater what you need in order to make it a successful trip so it's 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 kind of you know there are they're definitely keen to talk yeah and somebody mentioned the past thing that's uh, being consulted the uh, bsi are consulting at the moment yes we know about that we're making more comments <laughs> yeah i can see lots of questions in the chat which is always okay. oh, <laughs> don't keep up. this yeah. is very good that's always a great sign um, yeah, really yeah, there's a question about about lots of physical disabilities of deafness i mean there are lots and lots of overlaps and we do um try to con consider those sorts of things as widely as possible and we do think that a lot of the things that you could do for neurodiverse people benefit all of us but, but particularly we're, we're acting as consultants at the moment for a, a scheme um, where we are actually considering the widest range of disabilities physical and neurological that you could possibly encompass and deaf certainly has been one of those the fact that you need more space to be able to sign to one another therefore passages need to be wide so you need to be able to look at the other person's face things like that yeah and and um you know it, the more you can build in a bit of flexibility into say a flat layout because um somebody with autism probably uh they will like to keep that they won't like an open plan space the cooking kitchen is for cooking in and probably for eating but you know living space is not cooking and eating space so they won't like that open plan thing whereas you know somebody with a dis different disability would probably find it easier without having the door and the wall so the more you can build in that sort of flexibility the better sure uh thank you by the way um god i'm working out which question to ask i'm gonna ask eugene's quickly um with relation to part m do you think the answer to regulations better addressing the needs of neurodivergent people may be better consultation with those writing regulations. Is that something you're doing? Uh, well, we're certainly um, commenting on the on the BSI. Yeah, BSI. You said sorry. Yeah. Um, and we do have we're, we're building up some contacts where we're hoping to <laughs> uh, make some influence. But as uh, we not we haven't we were talking to somebody about one of the regulations but uh we do instead we go around we've offered talks to lots of local authorities so we're trying to just le raise awareness i think the level of awareness when part m was written it, it's just got a very narrow field of reference really to wheelchair users with a little bit about um you know impaired vision and sound but not much about those 
and nothing about really about dementia or, or and the same um, with the national policies for autism. disability and autism there there's remarkably little on the built environment so i think that's um mm. waiting to happen really a rewrite with those things included um you mentioned something really interesting the need for liminal spaces how are they've been how have they been defined by users and kind of how have you designed them into projects that you've worked on uh, well, I mean, entrances and thresholds, for okay. example, um, thresholds can be quite difficult for autistic people to cross. Yeah. Um, so we would always try and cover the entrance so somebody can, you know, have a porch or a canopy or something mm -hmm. and a bench. So there's somewhere which is sort of and a space off to them off the main route so that people can stand to one side. They can sit down. Maybe they can think about, you know, they can kind of brace themselves for the for the move so those sorts of things we do quite a lot and um non-specific spaces is good isn't it yes um, yes sometimes uh, the hall your hall in your flat it, it, it's, it's fairly bland and you've just got a load of cupboard doors and so that's ideal that uh there was a one young girl in a in a in it was sort of semi hostel and she used the hall because it wasn't defined as a room with a particular use. And every day at a certain time, she would bring out her sound system, put the music on and dance frantically for 10 minutes and then turn it off. And it was all gone away because if she could you know, make that space her own. But you could do things where, um, you know, where, where you put a curtain that could be pulled around a bed, for instance, so it can make a nest or a retreat. Yeah. Yeah, so yeah. that's not so much liminal as, as retreat, So, but they can be used as both. And sort of cupboard space and things, so things are put away, and loads of stuff on display is just, you know, confusing and, and, and stressful, I think. And also tends to kind of give a room a purpose and you might want to be doing something different. So try not to have things out on display is good. Sure. Uh, thank you, by the way. Really, really wonderful answer. Um, you also mentioned wander loops. I mean, is that something that could be like a, sim a simply a route around the building, or is yeah. it more than that? Is that is it literally it just could, it could be a route around the building? Yeah, yeah, yeah. You have too many un unforeseen encounters with other people. That was so, as long as it's wide enough, or there are bays you can stand to one side. Mm -hmm. um, outside is is is, is ideal, mm -hmm. and quite often oh, we've done layouts where you get a sensory garden, you go round a sensory garden, and then around another loop. But again, trying to avoid too many meeting too many other people because you may actually be using it um, as a way of, of calming yourself down, and what you just don't need is more input, as it were. Yeah. Mm -hmm. um, you mentioned or alluded to that that the school in the Harangay. Um, I was wondering if you can elaborate a bit on that project because I know a little bit about it too. But what are the most successful aspects from your perspective on the design of that school and how did you set about achieving them? As you know, as it's a day centre, one that at the beginning of the project. Yeah. Um, it's not yes. a school, it's a day centre. It's a day centre. Um, okay. It's all right. Um, well, I think the, the, the best thing about it is having got it done and persuading them to. Um, follow our design through and then finally appoint us on a full service, which was very late on as it went on site um, to actually be able to sort of, I'm afraid, slightly bully the builders into doing what they were supposed to be doing. Um, so, so to get the most out of this very, very tight budget with rather um, rubbishy old buildings and which needed an awful lot of input in on the services side, but just to get better layout so that we could actually create those spaces where with more option spaces with different kinds of teaching rooms and a better clearer circulation um, and working with their team working with their on the ground team was fantastic mm -hmm. they yeah. um they really they great. could really i didn't you know, right down to choosing doorknobs and where we could use color and whether we could use bright color and they were all for it and um, hopefully it will be seen through in the way that they operate the building because they're the people who will be operating it. And getting hold of that, um, per, that, that, lev, lev, that strata in the client body, this being a local authority, was quite tricky. And the people, the, the people who commissioned us had no idea what they really wanted. Mm -hmm. Brief was an A4 page. Yeah. And that was it. So it was working into that, which was the one of the best, was a challenge and one of the best results. Yeah, absolutely. And we managed to do, we worked really hard on the lighting to give this idea of choice. So 
each room has two or three different circuits and dimmers so that the lighting can be you know normal lights on the ceiling or it can be concealed lights uh, in the tops of the cupboards um, and you know we have the lighting in the corridors on dimmers so that if someone has a meltdown in a big room they can turn the lights down in the corridor and move them into a little room where they can kind of de reset without yeah. having to go through bright spaces so uh, a lot of that and as Helen says sort of choice giving different kinds of spaces different orientations some of them with color some of them neutral yeah that you know just that that trying to give maximum choice so that everybody could find their find their place and what, what determined what places were going to be you know with bright colors and what determined the places that were going to be kind of more neutral spaces obviously the escape places might be i presume more neutral but yeah they are um uh well it was just once we'd done the managed to carve out a better layout inside what was an old yeah. april day center um it was it was really just picking the rooms that would be where they would have most impact and agree with the client really um, yeah. And they were they were really up for co bright colour and so using it as signage, so you know, without yeah. having to have labels. So you know, bathroom doors, toilet doors were one colour, and kitchen doors were another colour, and mm. activity room change. So we did we did a certain amount of kind of colour coding, yeah, which worked. Mm -hmm. And what what were the kind of spatial demands of teaching space as well? You mentioned in the classroom. Um, they. Well, you need, had we had one communal kitchen where they wanted to be able to teach life skills. Basically, they wanted it uh -huh. to look look like a, your kitchen at home. Well, vaguely, if you had a big kitchen, um, but uh, but it had to be robust. So all the cupboard doors lock because uh, some people have eating um, eating fixations. They'll just eat everything. So yeah. if they're raw sausages, they'll just eat them. They'll eat them all. Um, so everything locks um, and it's fairly robustly built. So that was. One, but it had to look like a kitchen with big tables so that everybody could work around a table and face each other. Um, we, they wanted a room where they could get everybody in and have a big activity so that um, you could throw balls around and be quite mobile or jig around to music. Um, then they wanted some that were very small, which some of the very small ones are the retreat spaces where you can just go in and they can give you some coloured lights to calm you down or um, music and then there was sort of we just wanted to give different sizes really and we so we it, actually the buildings dictated a lot of it though <laughs> you're all within one envelope yes of course yeah, yeah, yeah. getting on site and finding that it was actually half a meter smaller than they told us was a little bit of a surprise and then we did things like acoustic panels in a lot of spaces to try and you know damp down the echoiness of the spaces mm -hmm. um yeah. Lights had to be up out of reach because otherwise people would jump up and yep. pull them down. So keeping things out of reach, we lined all the um, public uh, circulation spaces, well, the main with uh, birch face ply, which is great because it's a natural material and they like it and it's really robust. So if it gets kicked, it's not uh, going to come to too much damage. So there was a certain amount about materials and um, you know fittings and finishes and things that was had to be sorted out. Sure, and kind of feels like a silly question, but you know, what about the use of carpet? Does that ever kind of enter the fray, or yes, yeah, yeah. It's often a debate <laughs> because things get spilled, and not everybody is continent. Um, um, so, but we did go for carpet in the small rooms because obviously it makes for so much nicer an atmosphere. But we chose a carpet that was uh, they wanted one that couldn't be picked at too easily. It had to be plain with no dots otherwise they think it's a pattern um but equally it's a cheap and cheerful one that can be taken out and replaced when something dreadful happens to it um it didn't use carpet tiles because they'd get pulled up so it had to be a sheet carpet elsewhere we've used a uh, low voc um vinyl yeah mm -hmm. yeah adhesive free so adhesive free so that it can all be cleaned down very easily um i think it's wonderful that you your, your the length of the consultation you, you do with those within the neurodiverse community. Um, but what does the consultation look like for those when you engage uh, caregivers or care providers? What kind of what kind of questions or conversations are you having with them? To start with, we usually ask them to tell us about their their children or their carey or whoever they and their are, day. and yeah. what kind of day and what sort of thing. And um, I mean, one of the big things for 
people with autism is continuity they hate change you know so if they move into a home then they're going to want to stay there and most parents of autistic children are exhausted because they've just spent the whole of their child's life fighting for you know um, pro appropriate care and appropriate support and obviously when we come along we're a new centre which means that an old centre somewhere has probably closed down so there's definitely a level at which they're like no oh, no they're bloody change you know they, they, they don't really yeah. you know they you know that that almost is to start with is more overriding than the joy of the new place but then you know yeah. then you work you work through it but we saw them at, at at those early stages just for very open conversations with mm. um some photographs of buildings you know the buildings we've done and some things we thought yeah. were good for them to sort of bounce off as it were and then later on we we went back with the proposed scheme and the an outline of the color scheme and some of the broad brush fittings and then we again we showed them around when it was coming to finish, and um, I there, 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 there was one group of parents who were quite a bit worried about it, and um, I was showing them where we'd exactly we'd lift them, what, you know, what we'd change. I told them what we'd change in response. Yeah. They really appreciate. Mm. They weren't backward in coming forward. I mean, it was you know there was you know, they used to fight floods of information. <laughs> yeah, exactly about about you know and each each individual was different so they all had different you know different needs and mm. and they change as well you know mm. there was the, yeah, yeah. Uh, Michael, i think oh, maybe the final question is we have only five minutes left would be that um you mentioned you talked a lot about details which obviously are really really important um how important is it maybe a necessity that you're hired as a full service architect well it's better but yeah. it's probably, I mean, we can specify things like hinges and, you know, all of that stuff. But obviously, um, I mean, the, the contractor we had needed quite a lot of sitting on to make sure they actually did what was in the spec. So I suppose it, it depends a bit on the contractor and the whole setup, really. But uh, it, it, I guess, yeah. and it depends on your client. I mean, this, I, to be honest, the Haringey are quite siloed and so as we said the, the, the yeah. our commissioning client really didn't know why it was important that we were there to see see it through um or, or why some of the things we put in were important to have there so there was a period where we weren't involved where he cut out a load of stuff and, but he took away the porch for instance at the entrance and it just disappeared on one of the buildings and, and we haven't managed to get it back and he didn't see that it was important or why it might be important. And yeah, he was a commissioner for um, autism and, and mental disabilities. So um, and, and so if you don't have that backup from from behind, as it were, you, you get a bit toothless. So um, it, but it is so it's good if you can be throughout the project, really. Yeah, I can yeah. imagine. I can imagine. Yeah. Oh, I think that might be a, a nice way to maybe and if anyone else has any questions, we have like minute or two left now is the chance um i can't i can see conversation in the chat but i can't see any other questions um so i think on on that note so we're just reading the question no, okay. <laughs> <laughs> looking a bit dormless probably yeah thank you thank so, you. so thank you again so much for your excellent insight it's been absolutely amazing and a great way to kick off the cpd series for this year so and well, thank you again to uh, the audience as well who came and submitted questions as well i'll see you all next week if you want to join thank Until you then. thank you have a nice weekend bye bye bye, bye.